So I think the first order of business when I'm done is I have to check my Wikipedia page. <laughs> There's a rule about being a guru. Uh, you can't ever claim it yourself, but once someone else brands you, you can milk it for all it's worth. <laughs> so I want to talk about uh, open government, transparency, privacy. But what I really want to talk about the NSA. So I'll start with that and then, then generalize out. I've been working uh, with, against, near the NSA for a whole bunch of years. And uh, last summer, those of us who watched the NSA got an extraordinary uh, gift, a trove of a surprising number of top secret documents from the NSA, uh, taken out of the NSA by Edward Snowden, give, given to a bunch of journalists. And since then, journalists, I've, I've done some helping, have gone through those documents, uh, producing dozens of stories about NSA activities, about surveillance, about secret programs. Uh, it's been interesting to watch the reaction in the public. The, the first program talked about was in June of last year. And that was the Verizon program to collect everybody's cell phone data. Uh, that made an extraordinary splash, followed the next day by an NSA program to collect data from a variety of American ISPs and service providers like Google and Facebook, et, et cetera. And, and more stories have hit pretty steadily. Uh, there actually isn't an agenda. It's sort of as stories are found, there are a lot of documents. They're surprisingly technical. And I have been watching the general interest in these stories fade. You know, once the narrative is set, the, the, the details matter you know, to me, to the techies, but not really to the, to the general the public. I want to give some of the morals, or, or at least the major takeaways from sort of the summation of these programs, I think is worth, worth knowing. Uh, the first is, is to understand the NSA has turned the internet into a giant surveillance platform. Uh, this platform is robust. It's robust politically. It's robust technically. It's robust legally. Now, I can name three different programs the NSA has for getting at your Gmail and Yahoo uh, user data. Uh, they involve different technical capabilities, different legal authorities, and alliances with three different companies. Right? And that's just email. You assume the same is true for cell phone data, other internet data. When you're an organization with the kind of budget the NSA has, if you're given the choice of you do it this way or that way, you pick both. Because why not? Uh, the NSA continues to lie about their capabilities. It, it's surprising, but they still do. They hide behind a uh, unique and really tortured definition of words like collect, or incidentally, or target, or directed. Uh, they cloak programs uh, behind different code names. I mean, even inside the documents, it's, it can be hard to figure out when multiple code names mean the same thing. And I think this is uh, both to uh, obscure budget and obscure oversight. Uh, and, and I guarantee you whenever someone from national intelligence or the NSA testifies that something is not being done under this program or under this authority, I can guarantee you it is being done under some other program or some other authority. Uh, third, there's a lot of data sharing within government. You know, these documents about the NSA, but we do see shadows of the CIA, the FBI, DEA, NRO, uh, the sharing of data. The NSA will pass data on to the FBI if they see something they think the FBI will be interested in, pass data on to the DEA. We saw one document that talked about parallel construction, which would be the technique that a more due process oriented law enforcement agency would sort of reconstruct the data and really lie about where it came from because they couldn't say it comes from the NSA. That actually has changed recently. We're seeing more prosecutions where the data we're being told comes from intelligence gathering. Uh, the sharing of technologies. You know, we see some things that the NSA is doing that's exactly the same as what the FBI is doing technically. And it, it seems unreasonable that these technologies being developed independently. So I think it's a lot more data sharing. And they do public work for each other. You know, often you'll hear corporate denials about cooperating with the NSA saying, we don't cooperate with the NSA. It does seem that the NSA will use the FBI occasionally as their kind of front man. So in the PRISM program, the data went to the NSA from Google, but the FBI was the middleman. 
And it's sort of interesting to see that. Uh, the fundamental NSA mission is to collect everything. And, and you can see it in the documents. Right? There are slogans, collect it all, know it all, exploit it all. Uh, you can see it in the programs to collect data from obscure corners of the internet. Right? We just learned uh, yesterday, a couple days ago, that the uh, internet, air to ground internet on, on airplanes, GoGo, -Go, cooperates and provides data to FBI, NSA. Uh, I remember a story from last fall. The NSA was spying on virtual worlds, you know, like Second Life and EverQuest. I mean, it was, it was a funny story, but if your motto is to collect everything, that's part of everything. Right? And people could communicate there. And to understand that mission, you really need to understand the NSA's history. I mean, they were an organization born after World War II during the early height of the Cold War. Right? At a time when this all focused, almost voyeuristic interest in the Soviet Union was the norm. Right? That's what they were interested in. And the NSA collected a lot of data, some of it useful, some of it not. There's actually an interesting distinction between secrets and mysteries. Right? A secret is something, is a fact you don't know. A mystery might not be knowable. So it was a lot easier to get you know, the speed of the new Soviet battle tank than it was to predict the fall of communism. Now, it's much easier to eavesdrop on you know, the, the Soviet, the Soviet uh, let's say, the, the Russian government communications than it is to figure out what is Putin going to do next. So that ubiquitous surveillance, that's, that focused surveillance, died, faded, after the fall of communism, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And the NSA's mission started to change from eavesdropping to defending. And they had a lot of new programs, new initiatives, new openness. The pendulum had a swinging, and that changed immediately after the terrorist attacks on 9-11. After September 11th, the NSA got from the president an impossible task. Never again. Now, you can't possibly do that. But the only way you could ever hope to achieve ensuring that something doesn't happen is to know everything that does happen. So that giant eye turned from focus on the Soviet Union or China onto the world, onto everyone. And that changed the nature of the NSA's collection. Because if the enemy can be anyone, anywhere, you need to watch everyone, everywhere. So it was espionage. Government versus government espionage became surveillance. Government on population surveillance. Right, from targeted surveillance to ubiquitous surveillance. Right, and that's where it came from. Now, at the same time, technology changed the world. So that mission was aided by really the natural laws of technology. If you think about it, fundamentally, data is a byproduct of computers. Right? Computers produce transaction data. Everything you do on a computer produces a transaction record. Data is a byproduct of all your internet socialization. Companies, computers are all mediating our social interactions, and that produces data. Right? This data is increasingly stored and increasingly searchable. Right? But Moore's law here, data storage drops to free, data processing drops to free, and it's easier to save everything than it is to figure out what to save. And I remember this. Uh, when I first started using email, I had dozens of email boxes, and I would sort my email and delete things I didn't want. And, and you know, file it all very carefully. Uh, I stopped doing that in 2006. 2006, I saved everything one big mailbox. Who cares? Because right? in 2006, for me, for email, search became cheaper than sort. Right? And that tipping point has been hit for pretty much everything and will be hit for everything else soon. Right? It is easier just to save everything. The marginal cost of saving things is so low 
the marginal value has to be just as low. And this isn't a question of mouse on anybody's part. This is the way computers work. So what we have here fundamentally is a public-private surveillance partnership. And both groups have basically the same interest. Surveillance is the business model of the internet. right? We build systems that spy on people in exchange for services. That's what Facebook is. Right? And NSA surveillance largely piggybacks on these corporate capabilities. I mean, you, th you have to think of this as the golden age of surveillance. It is easy to surveil everybody. Right? And we do it willingly. Right? The government said you have to carry a tracking device with you 24-7. We rebel, yet we all carry cell phones. The government said every time you make a new friend, you must tell the police. We would be upset, yet we tell Facebook. Right? Again and again, very intrusive surveillance are things we put on ourselves. You know, for, 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 good re for good reasons, potentially. And one of the things you'll hear is that it's only metadata. Like the president said that back in July. The members of Congress have said that. The idea is that because it is not conversations, it is nothing to worry about. Uh, I think that's fundamentally wrong. Metadata is surveillance data. You can do an easy, easy thought experiment. Imagine you hired a private detective to, put, to uh, eavesdrop on somebody. That detective would put a, a bug in their home, in their car, bug their phone, bug their office, and you get a report of the conversations they had. Ask that same detective to put someone under surveillance, and you get a different report. Where he went, who he spoke to, what he read, what he purchased, what he did. That's all metadata. And fundamentally, metadata is surveillance. It is actually much more important than the conversational data. Right? Metadata tracks our relationships, our associations. It tells what we're interested in, what we're, what's important to us. It reveals who we are. And it is much easier to store, to search, to analyze than conversation data. I mean, there's a reason the NSA focuses on metadata, because that's where the action is. And the NSA has some sophisticated analysis tools. And we haven't seen a lot of this in the uh, news report so far, hoping there'll be more. You know, we hear a lot about the collection, not a lot about the use. The one exception was a very interesting story out of the Washington Post on the NSA's program to collect uh, cell phone location data, basically to track everybody. And they have a lot of really interesting analysis they do on it. Now, for example, they have a program called Co-Traveler that will look at people they're interested in and then look for other people that are geographically near them more than average. Right, so if I was a subject of interest, you all would be recorded as being physically close to me. Right, so they're looking for conspiracies that way. This is actually a really, really interesting uh, subset of that program where they put in the phones of, of US agents, of their people, and look for tails, because you can do that. They have, they have another program where they look for pairs of phones coming towards each other, turning themselves off, then turning the missiles on again an hour later, moving away from each other. Secret meetings. So there's a lot of this. And when you think about the collection used to this data, you have to think about the data being used together. Right? So it's Verizon metadata plus the contact list collection plus data mining. Or drones plus face recognition software plus Facebook's automatic uh, tagged fa uh, photo database plus NSA location database, and sort of everything together. And the other thing that's not talked about a lot, which I think is vitally important, is that this is not just about the NSA. Yes, the stories are about the NSA, because that's where the documents are. But this really is what any well-funded nation state adversary would do. Right? The US, because of its privileged position on the internet, because most of the big internet companies are American, uh, have some unique capabilities, but the techniques are general. I mean, I can go through some of the different techniques and say, and point out China does this, Russia, Iran, Syria do this. Right? These are things we see generally. And a lot of these techniques uh, spread. Like today's secret NSA programs, or tomorrow's PhD thesis, and the next day's hacker tools. Quite a lot of what the NSA does we see in the hacker community. 
you know, not as fancy, not as well funded, right? not as reliable, but it's the same stuff. I mean, these NSA techniques are really a preview of what cyber criminals are going to do a few years from now. And this fundamentally is the harm. When you think about the harm, this is it. Right? We have built an insecure internet for everyone. Right? We have enabled global surveillance by anyone with a big enough budget or enough motivation. Right? In our own country, NSA surveillance has pretty much broken all of our processes. It's broken our political processes because right? Congress cannot provide oversight. And we as citizens are kept in the dark of what's happening. It's broken our legal systems. We have, and it amazes me to say this, a secret court making secret rulings on secret laws. Right? It's broken our commercial systems. US companies are no longer trusted abroad. Because it is believed, and it seems to be true, that they will give data to the NSA if asked. Right? And our technical systems are broken. The very standards and protocols we rely on for security have been subverted. That's the harm. And we have to make a choice here. We can choose either an internet that is vulnerable to all attackers or an internet that is secure for all users. And that's not just a near term choice. Decisions we make on architecture stick around for a decade or more. Right? It's a choice we have to make for us and for at least our children. Now, there's good news bad news here. Uh, in his first interview after, uh, after identifying himself uh, with The Guardian, Edward Snowden talked about encryption. And I'm going to read what he said. He said, encryption works. Properly implemented strong crypto systems are one of the few things you can rely on. We actually know this is true. There's a bunch of examples, but we do know from the documents that this is true. Uh, his next sentence is, is the, uh, the bad news. And he said, unfortunately, endpoint security is so terrifically weak that the NSA can frequently find ways around it. Well, I, as I wrote when this, when this came out, the math is strong, but math has no agency. Right? To make the math work, we have to embed it in software, in a system, in hardware, in a network with people, and those are all the weak links. Right? We know that there is some crypto the NSA has, but that cryptography gives the NSA problems, at least at scale. Most of how the NSA breaks crypto is by getting around it, exploiting bad implementations, uh, weak keys, sabotaging standards, inserting back doors, demanding master keys or uh, what they call exfiltrating keys, which is NSA speak for stealing them. But mostly, the NSA relies on the unencrypted streams of data. Right? Internet data, most of it's not encrypted. Cloud services, most of it's not encrypted. Cell phone data and metadata, most of it not encrypted. And other third party data. So the problem here is you know, pretty obvious. We've made bulk collection too easy. And we've made it too easy for the NSA and others to spy on everybody instead of targeting. Now, the solutions are varied. And I think that's necessarily slow. This is a complex issue. And I'm going to talk about government self-corrections, uh, technical countermeasures, legal countermeasures, international cooperation, and, and, and shifts in, in how we think about security and privacy. And all of those are going to have to work together if we're ever going to solve this. So let's go over what we got. Talk about self-corrections. Inside the NSA, there is a new conversation going on. Right? As amazing as it might seem, the NSA had absolutely no contingency plans for someone walking out the door with pretty much all of their secrets. Right? It took them about two months to get a PR firm with the requisite clearances. I mean, now they have one, and their messaging is better. But you can be sure that they're thinking about this now, about it happening again, whether it happened before. 
Right? And that changes the cost-benefit analysis. There's been some pretty serious blowback from NSA surveillance, mostly in the realm of foreign relations. Right? And that's going to limit what the NSA does. Right? There's a basic change in the nature of secrecy in our culture. Right? There's a generation gap in terms of openness. There's a sort of difference in opinion. And the way the NSA works changed. You know, go back to the 80s. If you're going to join the intelligence community, the CIA, the NSA, whatever organization, right, you were picked from college, from Yale. Right? You got a job for life. You were let into the community. You were shown the secrets. You were protected. You would be protected in return. Right? That world is gone. A lot of this stuff is being done by contractors. The notion of a job for life is meaningless to people of our generation. Right? Snowden was 28. Manning was 26. Manning was on a four-year tour. Snowden was a contractor who saw a contract going up in a couple of years. These people did not have the same relationship with the secrets that a lifelong CIA analyst does. And this means the NSA is going to have to incorporate the risk of exposure in everything they do. Right? Assume that whatever operation they're planning becomes public in three to five years. And that changes things. Right? Nobody would have cared if the NSA spied on North Korea and the Taliban. It means that they spied on Belgium. Or even worse, that the UK spied on Belgium, which is like Connecticut spying on Nebraska. Right? That's the stuff we object to. And their risk analysis will change. It has to. Uh, there's another self-correction going on in broader government. Right? The notion of collect it all, know it all, exploit it all is being challenged. Right? The effectiveness of bulk data collection has not been demonstrated. And now there are a lot of people who are saying, what are we wasting this money on? Right. Too, many, uh, too much noise obscures your signal. Uh, too many false alarms overwhelm your system. I don't know if you remember, but in the early years, uh, the NSA was tipping off the FBI on plots. This is a New York Times article about Tuesday after like 04. The FBI said, stop sending us this stuff. They got 10,000 uh, tips, no actual leads. You, you, you just, the false alarms completely destroy your system. Right, and reliance on this detection inhibits other things. And so this conversation is happening. Conversation on the limits of intelligence. I don't know if you remember, uh, last year there was a story that uh, the US government had a three-day advance warning that Syria was going to use chemical weapons on its own citizens. The right, interesting question to ask is, if we knew that, well, why didn't we stop it? Well, there's a big difference between knowing something and able to do something. If the only thing you get out of your information is just you know, some, some voyeuristic uh, advance notice, then maybe it's not, that wor maybe it's not worth it. Right? Data doesn't equal information. Information doesn't equal knowledge. Knowledge doesn't equal action. The third self-correction we're seeing is inside corporations. Right? Corporations have a new cost-benefit analysis also. Right? It used to be when the NSA said, as they said to AT&T in 2002, hey, do you mind if I spy on everybody? Uh, and at and said, sure, great. Put your stuff in that closet over there. Lock the door. Don't tell anybody. And that's what happened. It's a different world now. Right? Now, because there is a risk of exposure, because companies are actually losing business because they are perceived as NSA stooges, there is value in fighting back. We're seeing more companies go public with things, take these uh, orders to court, demand orders. You know, we learned two days ago the story about GoGo -Go Internet, that they uh, voluntarily opened their systems for eavesdropping for the FBI and NSA. Right? That hit the press. GoGo -Go is not happy about this. Right? They're not going to do it next time. And everybody else is watching. So those changes will happen, and I think they'll be minor and around the edges, but they'll be important. There's a lot of technical countermeasures that are happening. 
Yeah, but I've been asked sometimes, uh, what's the most amazing thing I've learned from the NSA documents? And I will tell you what it is. It is that while the NSA might have a larger surveillance budget than the rest of the world combined, they are not made of magic. Nothing we see is fundamentally light years ahead of anything we've seen. They are constrained by the same laws of economics, of physics, and math as everybody else. Right? And te the technical solution is to leverage that. Right, to make eavesdropping more expensive. Right, we're never going to stop targeted collection. I don't think we want to. Right, there, are legitimate, there are legitimate espionage enemies of the United States that we want to spy on. Right, what we want to do is change the economics that currently makes spying on everyone easier. We want to limit bulk collection and force targeted collection. You know, and I can run through a whole lot of, uh, of countermeasures. Yeah, and various groups, Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, other, uh, other engineering groups, private groups, public groups are working on some of these. Right? Encryption tools, anonymity tools, computer security tools, you know, more openness tools. Target dispersal, kind of an easy one. I think we were way more secure than when there are 10,000 ISPs than when there are 10. Right? Assurance. This is actually hard, but this is, I, I think, the, the, the end game where we need to go. Some kind of technology that will allow us to determine that a piece of software does what it's supposed to do and nothing else. Right? It feels a little science fiction-y. People are working on it. Right? Largely, though, this is a political problem. And it's a difficult political problem. Right? We're long past the point where simple legal interventions can help. Now, I've been watching the uh, political debate, but there's been a lot of talk about the, uh, the telephone metadata program. I think because it was the first Snowden revelation, it's the one that's got all the news and all the political attention. And recently, President Obama made some changes in the program, ostensibly to make it uh, you know, more respectful of privacy and safer. And it's really very much around the edges. It is one program, one authority. Will it make a difference? I doubt it. You know, things are too interwined for a simple legal intervention like that to, have, to have make any difference. Right, the political solution, we kind of know the, uh, we know the framework of it. We know basically how to make it work. Right, transparency, oversight, accountability. That's fundamentally how we as a society ensure that those we give power to don't abuse that power. The details are complicated, but that's the basic framework. Now, one of the hard things here is that laws of lag technology. There's an interesting quote from uh, General, uh, General Hayden. General Hayden was the NSA director before Keith Alexander. Keith Alexander just resigned, and we have new habit General Roberts. Uh, and he said he was, he was being interviewed after his NSA years. Uh, on television somewhere. And he's talking about his authority and, and how he uses it. And this is what he's saying. I'm going to read it. Give me the box you will allow me to operate in. I'm going to play to the very edges of that box. So that's an interesting quote. It's not really bad. What he's saying is, you, Congress, you guys, it's your job. Right? Tell me the laws. Tell me my limits. I will play up to the very edges of those limits, like you'd expect me to do, because it's my job. But if there are limits, you have to tell me you guys are in charge of what's legal and not. I'm not. The problem with that is that technology changes the size of the box all the time. So you've got the NSA in their well-defined box. Assuming you can do this, right? You've got the NSA in their well-defined box. And suddenly, technology gets better. And now the box is bigger. Right? Someone invented wireless. Someone invented Facebook. Someone invented oh, you know, smartphones. And the NSA is much faster than Congress. So it rushes to fill you know, that, that new box. And when by the time Congress turned around and said, what's going on, it's like, you, know, you can't get rid of my existing capabilities. It'll degrade our uh, security. Right? That interplay between technology and law is, is makes this really hard. So I have some interesting proposals on, on what I think could happen here. 
The first one is that I think we have to separate, at least conceptually, certainly legally, and probably even in different agencies, this notion of, of espionage and surveillance. Right? That they're fundamentally different. That espionage, you know, government against government, is the sort of peacetime military maneuvering we have seen since the beginning of governments. You know, when, the, when the, we had the flap of the US spying on Angela Merkel's cell phone, I thought, well, isn't that what the NSA is supposed to do? Right? Spying on foreign leaders. That's the good thing. I mean, which, which foreign leaders we pick, right, that's going to be some kind of political decision, right? some kind of foreign policy decision. But spying on Angela Merkel's cell phone is exactly what we pay the NSA for. Right? It's all the other however many million Germans that we should start thinking about. So separating targeted espionage from this ubiquitous surveillance. Separate government on government from government on population. And it's really clear they're different. I have a colleague in the UK, Ross Anderson, who uh, studies a lot of security economics. And he was looking at the economics uh, of surveillance. And he made a really interesting point that when you are doing government on government, your allies in surveillance are your allies. Right? So alliances of nations will spy on rival alliances of nations. Right? US versus uh, NATO versus Warsaw Pact. That's a sort of thing. But when it's government on population, the alliances are different. Right? So for example, India buys its fighter jets from Russia. Right. India has always been closer to Russia than the United States. We've always been closer to Pakistan than Russia has. That's sort of the way that part of the world divides up. So India tends to get its military stuff from Russia. But they are in an intelligence agreement with the United States. Why? Because when you want to surveil populations, there's an enormous network effect. You want to join the largest network around. Right? This is why Saudi collaborates with the United States to spy on all their neighbors. I guess all the neighbors except Israel. Right? Who else are they going to collaborate with? Yemen? What has Yemen got? Right? When you are surveilling populations, you have these network effects where the big grow bigger. So they're very different. They're, it's, they're different legally. They're different ethically. And they're different in type, in kind. And if you think about it, the traditional espionage role born out of the military is necessarily secret. The NSA's traditional espionage mission is necessarily secret. The surveillance mission, government against population, is much closer to a police-like activity which is inherently open. What happened historically is both of those blended together and sort of fell into the military's norms. So we get the same level of secrecy on surveillance of populations that we get on surveillance of governments when it doesn't really apply. And by separating them out, we can have a lot more openness in how we surveil populations. Now, the, the, the kind of argument you will hear is, we cannot tell you what we are doing because, well, OK, okay, we can tell you, but we can't tell you, but not also tell the bad guys, because they read the New York Times too, and therefore we can't tell you. Sorry. But if you think about this in a law enforcement context, that's just not true. There's a really nice article in The Atlantic a few weeks ago. And the title was, Why Isn't the Fourth Amendment Classified? <laughs> right? The Fourth Amendment and the body of case law is a complex legalistic manual in how to evade search and seizure laws. <laughs> right? it, it tells the criminals exactly what they need to do to exploit any loophole we have in our laws. Yet we seem to survive as a country. And I'm not sure we can really claim that organized crime is somehow dumber than the terrorists or something. 
Now, there exists no police budget in the country that is classified. Right? Everything the police does goes through public legal proceedings. There's audits, there's oversight. And there's everything you get from a public discourse in capabilities. And there's no magic reason that when we do those same things against Belgium or Germany, as you do against American citizens, that suddenly secrecy is paramount. That once you separate espionage from intelligence, you can have a lot more openness. Right? And with that openness, we can get a lot more security. You know, last week, I was, I was on a panel with two senior NSA officials. And one of the things I told them, and I chose my word carefully, is that their actions have poisoned the internet. That they've poisoned the trust on the internet. That we no longer know what is secure and what isn't. We no longer know what we can trust and we, what we cannot. And if we need to protect ourselves from criminals or other countries or, you know, rival corporations, whatever our security needs are, we no longer know what's good and what isn't. Now, even if we get there, even if we manage to make this work, even if we manage to put security ahead of surveillance, reigning in the NSA only affects the United States. Right? I mean, it doesn't affect what China does. And this is also an argument you'll hear. Right? We cannot rein in the NSA because China does the same thing. Right? That's very much an arms race argument. Right? We're in an arms race here with Russia, with China. It's a zero-sum game. It's us versus them. If it's not us, it's going to be them, so it might as well be us. Right? That's the basic argument. I think that's fundamentally wrong. I mean, a secure internet is, is in everybody's best interest. That is in, the, it is in the United States' best interest to put security ahead of surveillance, even if China does not. Right? Last week, we had heart bleed. People were paying attention, I hope. It, it turns out it's really good if your vulnerability has a logo. It now gets on all the newspapers and all the news shows. <laughs> Right, but by the end of the week, we had the, uh, the predictable debate of, did the NSA know about this? Right, we had uh, a Bloomberg story where two anonymous sources, always useful, were quoted as saying, the NSA knew about this and exploited it for two years. Uh, we had the Director of National Intelligence uh, come out in his blog. The Director of National Intelligence has a blog. It's kind of an amazing world we live in and said no under no uncertain terms. Uh, we did not know about this. If we did, we would have fixed it. Uh, there have been two reactions to that. Uh, one has been, we don't believe you. We think you knew about it and used it and, and put the entire country at risk because of it. And two, you spend millions of dollars looking for vulnerabilities and you didn't find this. What the hell are we paying you for? <laughs> so they kind of you know, lose either way here. Right, but it's not a zero-sum game. What we really need to do is to get governments to realize that a secure internet is in everyone's best interest. Right? I mean, we have to turn the zero-sum game into a positive-sum game. Then we have laws and treaties to support it. We have technology to support the laws. We have laws and treaties to deal with non-compliant actors, both, both nation-state and non-nation-state. Right, this doesn't solve the problem. But it turns it into one of our other conventional, really, really hard international problems. Right? Money laundering, nuclear nonproliferation, human trafficking, I don't know, uh, small arms trafficking. I mean, we might be able to solve these problems, but at least we know what direction we're headed in. Right? At least we make progress over the years. In surveillance, we're not even we're moving in the same direction. But in the end, this is actually a social problem. I mean, fundamentally, we have to recognize that security from eavesdropping is important. And as long as we're scared, we're not going to do that. 
a really nice, uh, nice essay by uh, uh, former uh, Bush official Jack Goldsmith, who's actually my favorite uh, Bush official. Not a high bar, but he, he clears it well. <laughs> and, and he was talking about this notion of oversight. And what he was saying, and he made a really perceptive point, is that if you force Congress to provide oversight, you will likely get a much more permissive, permissive regime for the NSA to operate in because Congress is still fundamentally scared. Right? As long as we are scared, we're going to permit anything to happen in the name of security. Right? As long as we prioritize control over liberty, we'll never get any security. And that social change is going to be hard coming. It might very well be generational. I mean, just as we can look back at uh, you know, the internment of the Japanese during World War II and saying, what in the world are we thinking? Or look back at McCarthyism and say, are you kidding? Were we that crazy? I mean, someday we're going to look back at these years and say those exact same things. And it's a question of how soon that's going to be. And once we get there, I mean, once we get to the point where we prioritize security over surveillance, the neat thing is that the NSA can help. Remember back in the beginning where I talked about the NSA's dual mission and how after the Cold War, the uh, protect mission was starting to flourish? It can do that again. Right? The NSA has two jobs spy on enemy communications and protect our communications. Those jobs made sense to be separate when their stuff and our stuff were different. But now that everyone is on the same network, using the same hardware, the same software, the same systems, the same companies, right, those missions become in direct conflict. Right, that's why people ask the NSA, did you know about Heartbleed? And if you did, which side did you give it to? Right, once the default is to give it to the protect everyone side, there's an enormous role the NSA can play in security. Right, so that, that dual mission, unbalanced after September 11th, can be rebalanced. Right, and yes, defending our infrastructure, defending our people, also defends everyone else. But that's largely a good thing. Now, I started by saying that the information age surveillance is robust. And it's robust politically, legally, and technically. But we actually need to solve this. I mean, not just for the NSA, but for everybody. For the US, for other governments, for cyber criminals, for rogue actors. Right? A secure internet is, in, is vital to society. And we actually need to move forward getting there. Thanks. I am happy to take questions, comments, complaints, demands for more food. The question is not about surveillance, but about really data storage, what happens afterwards. And, and I think it's a really interesting question. In a lot of cases, we don't object to data being collected. We object to inferences being made. So we don't care that, oh, I don't know, that Amazon suggests books we might like based on books we've read, but what it kind of annoys us when Amazon decides we're gay. Right, right? <laughs> and then it's, it's the inferences that we object to. And, and certainly, uh, this data can be taken out of context. Uh, when data is not in our hands, we don't know how reliable it is. I don't know if anyone's gotten their, uh, their credit report. You, you can get them from the different companies. It's kind of surprising how inaccurate some of that is. Uh, data accuracy, I think, matters very differently than applications. I mean, you know, that credit data, I mean, it's important. Well, let's go to three things. It's, it's, it's actually not very important if they're using to figure out that you, know, you want to buy a car. Because if they get it wrong, they show you, an, show you an ad for a Chevy you don't care about. Right? So even a high error rate might still make it a, a good business. You know, if they use the data to either give or deny you a home loan, that's more important. If they use that data to drop a drone strike on you, that's like really important. And so depending on where you are, different error rates matter. The other thing you brought up is, uh, is, is the candidate change, right? either accident or, or maliciously, 
can the data be used, can be manipulated? And certainly there are examples, not in the United States, uh, but in, in, in North Korea. Uh, the uncle of the, uh, the ruler is being unpeopled, maybe erased from photos and archives. Uh, in the United States, uh, President Obama ordered some photographs of uh, the death of Osama bin Laden destroyed. You know, I mean, a, a really draconian thing to do for all of history. And I get locking them up for 100 years, but I don't get destroying them. Uh, I mean, certainly uh, you can use the data to, uh, to convict someone. We, we, that this is an example of that, sort of. In, in the trial of Chelsea Manning, the, uh, the defense, I was speaking to a defense attorney, who said basically that any piece of evidence that helped the prosecution was immediately de declassified and used. Any piece of evidence that would help the defense was cla always classified and couldn't be used. So there's a way to manipulate data just on classification rules. It's certainly you can imagine uh, data being changed. You know, we haven't seen much widespread examples of that. Uh, certainly we know uh, in, in Iran, I'm sorry, not Iran, Syria, uh, act, uh, activists and dissidents who have been arrested have been shown transcripts of their, uh, their chats uh, earlier this year in Estonia. People who have uh, attended a government protest uh, got an SMS message on the phone saying, you've been recorded as being in the vicinity of anti-government protest. Very chilling. So a lot of stuff can be done. Yeah, I, I'm, the long-term effects of storing this data are really still unknown. Right? We've never really lived in a society where, this data can be, where data of this magnitude and triviality can be stored for so long. And having it taken out of context, uh, we say that all the time. Uh, manipulation is sort of interesting to think about. Because certainly the data is mediated by power. Right? On my, uh, my iPhone, I can look up and I can see the last 50 uh, IM messages I had with my wife, the last bit of conversation. But after 50, that sort of scrolls off my phone, I can't see it anymore. Right? Apple still has it. And that's interesting. Given the NSA did not spy on American citizens, why, in your view, legally, this is wrong? Neither one of us are attorneys. Well, but that's, that's also not true. I mean, when we saw the Verizon quarter, they got the data on everybody, not just you know a few people. NSA spies on American citizens. They they there are a bunch of, of tricks they use, right? It, it's incidental, so they can collect it incidentally. So, for example, they can only go after data if there is a greater than 50% chance it is non-American. Right? Uh, more than half of all Gmail users are non-American. Right? That means Gmail is open season. Right? They can plausibly say that any Gmail trunk connection is non-American. Now, we're all on there, but that's, you know, that's beside the point. And there are a bunch of other examples of that. So we see bulk collection against Americans again and again and again. Right? It is not targeted on the bad guys. And, it, and it is an important point that we have to just understand, that this is not just foreign. And then the question to ask is, you know, morally, you know, why are foreigners different? It's a pretty different conversation to have. You know, is, are, are you know, the citizens of Germany somehow you know, less deserving of rights than Americans are? And Obama hinted at that in his speech on surveillance in January. He talked about extending some rights to, uh, to non-Americans. And, and you're right. I mean, this is, America is in a unique position to do this. No other country does anything like this. This conversation probably can only happen in the United States. I mean, we're the only co you know, we complain about the secret FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court. But we are the only country that has a court that rules on these things. Which means we are in a singular position to have this conversation. We have to have this conversation because you can't in China. And because we are the position we are, that we can do this, that we can do this properly, that we can say bulk surveillance isn't effective, is too costly, we shouldn't do it. You know, and, and that's why we should. So do you think it's realistic to secure most, uh, most software and hardware? Like with, there's, it feels like there's a limited number of things that can properly update to resolve the security issue, but more and more of it's embedded in some hardware device that is difficult to touch or difficult to update. You know, I mean, that's certainly hard, right? And, and the thing we learned about the OpenSSL heartbleed is how, uh, 
how damaging an incredibly pervasive piece of technology can be when a vulnerability is discovered. And, and I agree with you, one of the uh, real worries, and when, when you think about moving forward the Internet of Things, a lot of these devices are very low cost, very low engineering capability, and not patchable. I mean, right now, there are a bunch of routers and cable modems affected by Heartbleed, where the upgrade path involves a trash can, a credit card, and a trip to Best Buy. You know, that's kind of lousy. <laughs> but that'll happen more and more. Because right now, these embedded devices, whether they're your thermostat or, you know, we keep talking about your refrigerator and sort of all these small things, are in the same position computers were in the mid-'90s when there wasn't really any organized update and patch facilities. The difference is that these devices today are much lower cost, and the economics is way different. And you're just not going to see that kind of upgrading. So that is something to worry about. You know, we're sort of learning how rickety is not the, not the right word, but how, how brittle our infrastructure can be. And the nice thing about Heartbleed is we did pretty well. At, at, at getting the word out. And they actually, I do credit the fact that they had a logo and a cool name. That made a huge difference. I and mean, usually we're terrible at, uh, at communications in, in tech vulnerabilities. We did a great job there. So I think that's, you know, there's, there's a lot here. But yeah, the, the embedded systems, and that, that's something to watch. One possible way to fix the problem is to separate the espionage from the surveillance, so which you might you kind of termed as the military versus the police side. But isn't separating those two actually going against the trend? Because uh, it seems like the police are actually getting more militarized over time. Isn't this going against the trend? And, and how, how is that actually going to work? You know, I think it is going against the trend. I think it's more, more, more reason to push for it. I think the trend of the militarization of police is a dangerous trend for a whole lot of reasons. We know way bigger than this talk. But yes, I think we need to push more into domestic poli uh, peacetime policing than into military. I agree that we need to focus away from populations and more on adversaries. How do you do that if you have an adversary that is asymmetrical and highly decentralized? So I mean, the same way we do it in normal life, right? following the leads. When you look at the actual successes in counterterrorism, they don't come from ubiquitous surveillance. They don't come from broad surveillance. They come from following the leads. Right, the great example of the liquid bombers in London, you know, who were caught in their London apartments before they got to the airports. Right, you know, new technique, new, new tactic that would have gone through airport security because it was designed that way. And they were caught through good old-fashioned police work, following the leads. And, and I think that's what we need to do. I mean, terrorism isn't different. You know, we, we have a real perceptual problem because 9-11 changed. I mean, it didn't change everything, but it changed the way everyone thought about everything. Right? You know, terrorism is largely you know, Boston Marathon-like. I mean, that's the sort of thing it is. Right? And that's the sort of thing you deal with through following leads. You don't, you look at a surveillance doesn't, uh, doesn't catch that. I mean, it didn't, right? I mean, one, and one of them was on a terrorist watch list. I mean, you'd think if ubiquitous surveillance would have worked, we would have been getting against these guys. So we have to recognize that the tools we have work, and that's OK. Right? We're not going to get perfect security against any crime. Life is like that. So a little bit of you know, readjusting our, our perceptions would help. And that's what I think is generational. You know, you, you, there was more airplane terrorism in the 80s than now, yet you know, we didn't really think about it that badly back then, so no one remembers that part. 70s, 70s were bad, too. You know, so it really is our perception more than the reality. Right? The reality is that the normal type of police work, the normal type of, of things you'd expect from international cooperation of police against terrorism to do would work. When another country invades the United States borders, as they did in Pearl Harbor, there's chaos. Our society collaborates and figures out ways to solve that problem. However, when another country invades our cyber borders, and I will keep the countries out of this, but there have been reports of countries invading our cyber borders, there doesn't appear to be the same amount of chaos. I can't necessarily call my local police department and say, hi, I've been hacked by another country. Can you come and help? But if my door is broken down by a burglar, I can call my police and they come and help. Can you help me figure out how to solve that problem? 
All right, so this is a hard problem. So I'll name country names. I'm not proud. Uh, I mean, the difference between you know, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and when the Chinese attacked Google is that a lot of people died in Pearl Harbor and a lot of people got some unpaid overtime in Google. I mean, it's fundamentally different. And that's one of the reasons you don't see the same chaos, because it's not actually as chaotic. And, and this, is, this is interesting and important. Because when you deal with cyber attacks, there's an enormous gray area between war and espionage. And in the military terms, uh, there's something called CNE, Computer Network Exploitation. That's espionage. And CNA, Computer Network Attacked. That's you know, destroying stuff. Destroying the power grid would be an example. And certainly in wartime, you have to assume that there will be a cyberspace component to any war in the future. Uh, most countries now have some sort of cyber command. The US has a, a pretty big one. And there will be cyber weapons and you know, cyber attacks and cyber defenses. And you, know, you can sort of write your own movie here as part of any greater war. The question to ask is whether some of this normal peacetime activity, where does it fit in? I mean, where does you know, China hacking Google fit in? I mean, it's obviously not the same as Pearl Harbor, but you know, is it fundamentally different? I mean, you mentioned I mean, a nice analogy. When a burglar breaks down your door, you call the police. But when somebody breaks down your computer, you don't know what to call. And I'll give you tell you why. And I don't have the answer for you, but I can, I can frame you the question. That in our world, in the real world, when you're attacked, I mean, are there any number of people you can call to defend you? I mean, you can call the, the military, Homeland Security, the FBI, your corporate lawyers, you know, maybe you're a bunch of products and services. Right? The, and the legal regime in which your defense operates depends on exactly two things. Who's attacking you and why? And if you think about it, when you're attacked in cyberspace, the very two things you don't know are who's attacking you and why. That makes defense difficult, because you don't know what norms you're operating under. Right? In the real world, you can tell the attacker from the weaponry. Like we look outside, and we see a tank. We know the military is involved, because only the military can afford tanks. Right? The weaponry determines the attacker, determines how we defend. On the internet, all attackers look the same. They use the same techniques. They use the same tools. So when you're being attacked, you're Google. You don't know, is it the Chinese military? Is it a couple of guys? It makes a big difference, but you have no idea. And oh, you've got oh, two milliseconds to figure it out. So it's this great policy area that we have to deal with. Another question is, what norms do we operate in? And what we're seeing is that largely, the military is trying to move into that gray area. They're trying to do more defense under the assumption that any attack is a nation. Right? That any attack we get is a nation going to war with us. Not very likely. We'll probably attack millions of times per second. It's been war exactly zero times. Right? It's not really the way to bet. But the fear is so great that that's turning into the default. So that's the flavor of where we have to have the discussion. You know, where, what are the norms of this gray area? Are they war norms or are they, are they police norms? And that's why this is so hard. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks for enjoying the food. I will, I will be here to answer questions. Thank you.